Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 938, Her Secret. And I'm not gonna lie, this week's chapter had me feeling a bit meh for a couple of different reasons. Not meh as in bad, but more like certain things left a very odd aftertaste once the chapter was completed. And I'll start with the more minor one first, which was Zoro falling so easily. Now I don't want to be one of those guys who goes, omg, Zoro should not have fallen unconscious from a single hit. But at the same time, he really shouldn't have. You cannot tell me that after everything we've seen this man go through, you know, think back on the fight with Does Bones, where Zoro got completely minced, or the encounter with Kuma, where Zoro took all of Luffy's pain and was still standing. All of these feats pre time skip, by the way. But after having that sort of history with the character, I guess I just don't believe that a single strike to the chest is going to bring him down, even if Zoro does admit that it was his fault. And it's not just because I'm a rabid Zoro fanboy either. If a similar situation had happened to Luffy or Sanji, I would feel exactly the same, which was demonstrated when I did my anime review on the Sulong Pecoms episode, and the whole filler sequence in which Pecoms essentially one shot Sanji. It was very out of character for Sanji there in that filler, and it was very out of character for Zoro here in this canon material. So I wish there was some sort of explanation like Kamazo's scythe was poisoned or I don't know anything more than what it is we got. Because at the moment, it seems a lot like having Zoro fall suddenly unconscious is a very clunkily executed narrative device to let Kyukimaru escape, as well as to let Zoro have some exposition time with Hiyori. And here we go. This is the uh, primary thing that leaves me feeling a bit weird. The ending of this chapter has Komurasaki revealing what was definitely the most prominent theory we've had up until now, that she is in fact Hiyori. Although the kind of confusing thing is that the chapter doesn't explicitly state that this is Komurasaki, we only get that information through a map of Wano that was included in Weekly Shonen Jump, labeling Zoro, Toko, and Komurasaki in the same location of Ringo. Why is that important? Well, because without the map, I probably would have come away from this chapter thinking that Hiyori was just a completely different character. I mean, yes, she does look exactly like Komurasaki, but Oda's beautiful women are very formulaic, and I would not have put it past him to introduce another using that model. But the thing about Hiyori is that she also acts absolutely nothing like the Komurasaki we've come to know, not one bit. Hiyori is very feminine, fragile, and more inviting, whereas Komurasaki was strong and cold. So apart from the physical resemblance, there is nothing here to indicate to us that this is the same person. And I find that really kind of annoying because it's such a jarring shift. So I guess the argument could be made that Komurasaki was a persona that needed to be adopted to get through whatever situation Hiyori was in, which I imagine lasted years at this point. But then why does it feel like her character has regressed to like the state of an innocent teenage girl? It doesn't make a lot of sense because even if Komurasaki was an act, Hiyori clearly presented herself as a very worldly woman woman, and now she seems like just another helpless girl. Which brings us to another potential explanation. Komurasaki was the truth, and Hiyori is the lie. This is an idea that fits a bit nicer in my head, because someone like Komurasaki would be capable of such deception. But obviously the question becomes, why? And I, I guess I don't really know. Look, maybe Toko is actually Hiyori, and Komurasaki is just playing the part until they find themselves in a trustworthy situation. Or we could go one crackpot theory step further, and say that Komurasaki is Lady Toki, Toko is Hiyori, and the two traveled forward in time just after she sent the others away to an earlier point in Wano's history. Toki then adopted the guise of Komurasaki and yeah. And I'm not saying that I seriously subscribe to that sort of idea, but time travel is at play in this arc, and so anything can happen. I mean, with the serious differences in personality, maybe Komurasaki is actually dead, and the younger version of Hiyori that has appeared is going to have to tragically travel back in time to fulfill whatever purpose the killing of Komurasaki served, at which point we'll see the death scene again, and it will be infinitely heartbreaking. And yes, I know it's supposed to be impossible to travel back into the past, but meh, the idea is still there. In fact, there's a lot of possibilities here and I don't think that anything should be discounted as of yet because there is something undeniably strange happening here. And I don't think the explanation is uncharacteristically poor writing from Oda. Although I don't know, maybe it is. Because after every femme fatale becomes a protagonist, they do become noticeably more feminine and useless. I just hope not in this case. Other than that, I'd have to say that this chapter was fairly uneventful. Pretty much everything else consisted of a quick check-in with a few key groups, no prisoner mind stuff. Although there was an interesting moment where Yasu strolled in, knowing both Shinobu and Kanjiro by name, and expressing some keen interest in the final battle. So this is going to give rise to the thought that Yasu is Denjiro, the third samurai we're after, which would definitely be unexpected. It's difficult to gauge how likely this is, but both Kanjiro and Shinobu don't really seem to recognize him. But you know, I do think it would be cool if we didn't have to work too hard to get the third one. Like we've already got to convince one of these three samurai to fight and break another out of prison. It would be a nice change to have Dendro just stroll on up. It also makes a bit of potential narrative sense because when you think about it, Kinemon was the one who interacted with Ashua Doji, while Raizo was the one who found Kawamatsu. And yeah, why not round things out nicely by having Kanjiro find Dendro? Seems legit to me. Elsewhere in the chapter, we also saw Drake and Hawkins appear, and I never thought I'd say this, but they were probably the most uneventful part of this week, and their panel was probably unnecessary. All it really did was deliver a joke, and while I did undeniably enjoy Hawkins giving Drake a bit of grief, I just came away from it apathetically, which goes for the whole chapter, really. 
It was also a bit of a short one, so I don't think that helped at all. Like another two or three pages could have delivered us a fairly decent scene that might have beefed things up a bit, but you know, what can you do? And that pretty much does it for chapter 938. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of your amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. Also do check out my Teespring store if you're interested in shirts, hoodies, and other miscellaneous items with the proceeds going directly to support the channel as well. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.